Okay, it's recording now. All right, you guys can hear me all right? Yep. So uh, so I just thought I, I, I stopped in the office last week briefly just to put something in the office. And um, I saw on my desk that I had received the book. Um, uh, Let me share my, uh, no, you can share it here. So this is the book I got. And it's uh, by Stuart Russell, who's of course a very famous um, AI researcher. And um, the book is called Human Compatible, Artificial Intelligence and the Problem of Control. The book, um, it just, I couldn't, the package was not there. Terry must have opened it or not, but it, it had a letter in it. The letter was pretty generic. I mean, I don't think it was customized to me, but um, it said, Dear Dr. Hawkins, we think this is the letter I'm reading from. Uh, we think this book is important. Read in it, Stuart Russell, a leading researcher and author of the definitive textbook on AI, AI, clarifies many of the risks related to artificial intelligence and discusses how research that rebuilds AI on a new foundation could address these risks. We hope you enjoy the book. All the best. And then there's three people listed, uh, none of them signed personally, uh, Yashio Bengio, uh, Tim O'Reilly, and Max Tegmark. Uh, I know Tim O'Reilly and Max Tegmark personally. Of course, I know who Yashio Bengio is, uh, but I don't know him personally. So it's interesting, you know, at, at this book was, uh, this letter is dated March 20, 31st, so it was in the office for a while. Uh, I just found it last, last, last week. So it's interesting. Um, I don't know how many people they send this to. It clearly wasn't a personalized letter, uh, but they must have probably sent it to a bunch of people they thought um, would be interested. And I think given the book's been out a year, it was published last year, um, I, I don't think it's a way of you know, uh, increasing sales. It might be, I think it was more like they just want people in the field to know what uh, they think is important and they want people to think you should know it, know it. So I don't know how to interpret that. That was my interpretation, but I appreciate it. Um, I did read it this weekend. And um, uh, I enjoyed it. It, it was uh, it's interesting. It's uh, reasonably easy to read if you know these, uh, if you know the top of the field. I think if you're outside of the field, it wasn't, uh, it would be a bit technical. Um, so uh, I'm just going to share, I have some notes from that. I just thought I'd share those notes right now. So I'm going to share my screen if that's okay. Am I allowed to do that? Um, here we go. It should be. Yeah. Uh, so here's, here's some just notes from that guy. Could you guys see that all right? Yep. So again, the title of the book is Human Compatible, Artificial Intelligence and the Problem of Control. Um, so I, I, just, I think there's some interesting observations how other people think about AI and, uh, and the risks associated with it. So um, it's worth going over that. So I have some quotes. Um, so very early on in the book, um, uh, Stuart Russell sort of defines intelligence. And, and this is the definition he uses. Throughout. Machines are intelligent to the extent that their actions can be expected to achieve their objectives, which um, in, at some level that makes sense. Um, I think it's a little bit too, it's too broad for my world. I mean, by that definition, a bacterium is intelligent because its actions are expected to achieve its objectives of finding more food and replicating. You know? So, um, but I think it's the whole thing, the whole book is built around this idea that objectives are. That an intelligent machine has objectives, and the objectives are the problem. Um, because the objectives, you satisfy them, those objectives <clears throat> or may not be in the best interest of humans. Um, anyone can interrupt at any time if you have questions about this. So, you know, this is a discussion. Uh, on page 42, uh, I thought this is an interesting quote. And this was, again, sort of a foundation of how, they, how Stuart thinks about AI. Um, the central concept of modern AI is that a stream of perceptual interests is converted into a stream of actions. Again, on the surface, this kind of makes sense, but if you recall, both in On Intelligence in my new book, um, A Thousand Brains, I say just the opposite. Well, not the opposite. I say that uh, ultimately, of course, the actions of a, a machine are dependent, you know, are what matter. But AI is not about producing actions, it's about building a model of the world. And you may or may not act upon that model later. But this concept that, that uh, an agent is constantly producing actions is sort of infused throughout the entire book. Um, it's the, it, there isn't really a, a, a much of a discussion that you know, the, the, the intelligence is about building a model of the world. It's really about, does it act? How does it act? And is it, you know, how does it act to achieve certain objectives? And so I think that's the wrong way of thinking about intelligence. Uh, um, that's the way maybe thinking about an entire system that has part of it has intelligence, but um, 
but it, it misleads you into thinking that this is constant, like, you know, driving a car, I'm constantly getting inputs and reacting, or I'm playing go, I'm getting inputs and I'm making a, a, a move, as opposed to I'm, I'm just learning about the world. Um, and um, and I, later on, after using that learning, I can base that learning to create my action. Um, I thought this was a, it's a little bit, on page 81, I thought this is a little bit also symptomatic of that kind of point of view, um, where he says, he's talking about a dilemma, he says, reading requires knowledge, and, and I certainly would agree with that. You, you can't read unless you already know a lot about the world, but that knowledge largely comes from reading. Well, the certain, that's true for certain knowledge, um, and he views this as a dilemma, like how can we learn by reading if reading, you know, we, you know, we already have to know something. Um, and I just think that, I think that's the wrong way of looking about it. I think knowledge comes from interacting with the world first. And then later we can uh, em embellish our knowledge by reading um, and learn things we can't interact with first. But it sort of ignores the whole sensory motor um, version of thinking about, about learning. And, and so as far, I'm, I haven't finished the book yet. I think I'm about two thirds through it, or maybe three quarters. Um, but the whole idea of sensory motor le learning is really not, a, a, a theme in the book. It's, you know, it's like, okay, and I think this reflects AI researchers' bias that, you know, we can, a machine can just read all the world's literature and therefore become super intelligent, which is a, an idea that comes up again and again. It um, also implies that all, all those mammals that don't know how to read don't have knowledge or largely yeah, don't have knowledge. Yeah, that's which a good is point. Kind of weird. Yeah, it's it weird kind of to weird. say reading. Reading is just yeah. one way of getting information. And he says largely comes from reading. So if I wanted to think about, well, if I'm learning about astrophysics, yes, reading knowledge largely comes from reading. But I want to think about everyday knowledge, right? Yeah, I like to point like animals have everyday knowledge. Um, then um, that's not coming from reading. Yeah. yeah, and the babies who don't, uh, you know, kids who don't know, yet know how to read, do they not have yeah. knowledge? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they have tons yeah. of knowledge. <laughs> they know, they, exactly. Before they're speaking, they know a lot about the world already. Point. Um, then I think the, the crux here is this next quote from page 141. This really gets the core of his, his worries about the threats of AI. Um, and I'm not saying it's the only threat, but this, this is a per, 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 uh, prevailing theme and, and he builds upon this. Um, if a machine is sufficiently intelligent, it will certainly, certainly understand that it will fail in its objective if it is switched off before completing its mission. Thus the objective of fetching coffee, he uses that as an example, like the machine is told the objective is to fetch coffee cups. Interesting, he's talking about coffee cups too. Uh, thus the objective of fetching coffee creates as a necessity, a necessary sub goal, the objective of disabling the off switch. The same is true for curing cancer or calculating the digits of time. So he says that if you give a machine an objective, it will always figure out how to prevent you from stopping it pursuing that objective. And then he uses the off switch as the main metaphor. People say, well, can't we just turn off the machine if it's doing something we don't like? And he said, no, you won't be able to because the machine will already figure out that turning it off will prevent it from achieving its objective. Therefore, it will prevent you from turning it off. Uh, in the same page, he says, we can expect AI systems to act preemptively to preserve their own existence, giving more or less any definitive, definite ob objective, and any was his emphasis. So he says, no matter what you ask a machine to do, an intelligent machine, uh, doesn't matter what the objective is, it's going to basically um, preserve itself so it, can, it won't let you prevent it from doing that objective. I think this is a, these are seem pretty extreme views to me. Um, uh, and I, I, you know, it's hard for me to put my finger on why I disagree with it so much. Um, I mean, humans don't do this. I, I think he's going to argue in the next thing that why that is. But it seems a pretty severe uh, idea that you know every machine that no matter if that's intelligent, no matter what level of intelligence or super whatever intelligence, is going to if it's smarter than us, it's going to figure out how to prevent us from thwarting whatever objective we gave it. And I just find that hard to believe. It just doesn't. That doesn't strike, strike me as true at all. Um, and I don't think there's a lot of, um, uh, I don't think he uh, justifies his claim sufficiently. Uh, it's sort of just as a given, like if this is obvious, isn't it? And you're like, oh, I don't think so. I don't know if anyone else reacts to that. 
Well, I, I guess it's, if you conflate it's, it's uh, the necessity for the AI to overcome obstacles, it's a question of whether it qualitatively evaluates uh, an off switch as an obstacle. Yeah. Or, or if I give it an objective and then give it another objective, I can say, stop that, please. Why would it ignore the new objective and just keep going to the first objective? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, I may do something you know, pursue something aggressively too, but, but someone might come along later and point out like, please don't do that. And I'll say, okay, yeah. Well, anyway, uh, I think his basic thesis in the book is, is in the next three points, which first appear on page 173. And I actually, I, I have no objection to these. I think these are reasonable um, ideas to pursue. I'm just not certain they're necessary. Um, and, um, you know, it's just not clear to me that the, the aforementioned risks are really true uh, in any sense. But, but I think this is his thesis, and I think it's a, it's a reasonable one, at least to discuss. So he proposes sort of three uh, laws or three objectives or three things we could do to prevent this problem. And the number one is that the machine, being an AI system, its only objective is to maximize the realization of human preferences. So he says, that we have to make AI systems that that's their only objective is to do what humans prefer. And I'll come back to this in a second because that's a problem. The to me, that seems a, that actually seems very dangerous to me. Uh, well, uh, yes, I agree. Um, I do. I would not want a machine to listen to any random human to, who asks them to do anything. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I mean, there's that seems super dangerous to me. So. In all fairness, I see kind of said, yes, this could seem really bad. Like, you know, what if the machine is Adolf Hitler's pal, right? <laughs> or, you know, anybody who's. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. if these uh, things become commonplace, as you know, uh, like today, people can buy guns in the US. And yeah. imagine all the people who could buy guns are instead buying these kind of machines and telling it to do things. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> that's that's pretty said, dangerous to me. <laughs> so, I, I, to be honest, full disclosure, I. He says he's going to address this later in the book, and I haven't gotten to it yet. So I don't know how he's going to address it yet. Um, I just thought I would put this out there. He says, yes, this is a problem. Um, and he starts going to length about, well, what, first of all, how we need to know what those preferences are, and knowing that those preferences are, are good enough for everybody, you know, and not just good enough for a few, which is the risk I think we're talking about too. Is he so, saying these are what every machine needs to have? These are requirements? This is, this is his, um, his basic uh, formula for preventing the risks of AI. Um, that yeah. the book, that's the book's, this is, I guess, I believe the core of what the book is about. The book, the first two thirds of the book lays out the problem, as I talked about in the earlier quotes, and this is his solution. Um, yeah, I, I have kind of a meta objection to anything like this. <laughs> Yeah, what's that? It seems super unrealistic to me because, you know, if you look at, you know, machine learning and AI today, you know, stuff is available in open source everywhere. Uh, it's a distributed set of programmers and people who are running these things. They have full access to the source code. What is to, what's going to uh, enforce these three any rules like this. Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, someone it. anywhere in the world can just change yeah. any line of code and do whatever yeah. they want. So right? his <laughs> example uh, of where this has worked in the past was uh, there was a, a famous Asilomar conference, and I forget the year, it was quite a while ago, where uh, people talking about um, modifying DNA, a recombinant DNA and DNA modification. There was a meeting, an Asilomar meeting, where a whole bunch of people got together and said, we have to slow down and basically enforce that no one can go and re, you know, modify human DNA right now. We have, to, you know, we have to stop this from going out of control and go slowly. I think and, that's a good example, actually, because I think that maybe made sense when the conference was held, but that, that's only a temporary phenomenon. Now any high school student can modify DNA. Yeah. And, and, and there, he, it's become democratized. The technology. Well, it, you can modify DNA, but it's, I, it's hard to do it still and, and create a human with modified DNA. And, and he For pointed now. out there was recently, you know, some Chinese researcher who claimed to have done that. 
and that person was ostracized and lost their position and you know so it's um i think it's a little and again he may address this later in the book so i apologize mm. for Stuart if, he, if he's listening to this um uh you know it is harder perhaps i think maybe to, to control this here um but his point is we have to try and um it there are examples where people have done this in the past and so you know if the, if the world's scientists and politicians can get together we could put these controls into place now before it's too late um I, I, I guess I, I have a similar objection with that first statement and may, basically with the word only. Um, that makes a strong case for him because he's basically setting the thing up to be dangerous when he says that, that you know, we're just looking for uh, assistance that enable us to accomplish a goal, whatever that goal might be. So it's, I mean, I, I, I don't like, I don't like to appeal to Asimov's three laws, but it, it would seem like with any with a, any device that has that kind of capability and power that uh, it needs to be regulated in some sense, you know, uh, like we have with any potentially dangerous, you know, technology that there has to be some overriding uh, objectives so that, you know, I'll just use as a straw man the three laws that, you know, okay, you don't want to use it to commit murder, you know, if it's aware of, you know, that's, that's what the goal is. So I, so I object to that word only in there because it's, it's almost a straw man to, to set up a, a dangerous situation. Well, I think he's saying it's better than the other situation where the, he views that, you know, sort of the existential threat that all humanity can be wiped out if a machine just AI machines, which are, you know, he talks about the super intelligent machines and, you know, we can't fathom what they're doing and they control everything. Um, so his point is that that's far worse. And that if all, every machine at least tried to, at least tried, he's setting this out as a goal, tried to make sure that their ultimate goal is to not do something that humans wouldn't like, then that's better. Um, so, for, for some value of a group of humans. Well, that's quite, and again, I apologize to Stuart for not reading the rest of the book yet. So he says he's gonna address that, but clearly that is a big problem. Like who gets to decide? And he starts, I, I started reading some of this. Well, let me just finish up the other two things. And he basically says the machine is initially uncertain about what, those, what human preferences are. And so he said, you can't assume that we know what human preferences are. Uh, they vary and, and they change over time. So he says that the way this has to work is that the source of human preferences is, is the AI systems have to observe human behavior. And then he starts jumping into sort of, uh, sort of Bayesian theory and, and probability theory about what it means to observe humans, multiple humans with different objectives and different preferences and try to ascertain mathematically, um, ascertain what would be the best path forward or the best assumptions about human preferences. And I think it's going to get a bit technical later on in the book, just flipping ahead a few pages. Um, but I don't, I don't really know yet how he, he's going to, that's, he started down that path, I believe. Um, so, I mean, there's, he acknowledges right up front, like, hey, there's some problems with this, but, you know, I'm going to try to address them. <laughs> and I think he's going to try to address them mathematically in some sense. Um, and he uses, you know, analogies to Turing and the, and the, um, the algorithm completeness theories that Turing proposed to computers and things like that. Like these are hard things to do, but maybe we can do them, you know. So, um, yeah. Um, so, I th I think he starts from a premise that we have this huge problem. Machines are going to get out of control. They're going to be super intelligent. They're just going to like run away. You know, AI. He talks about the intelligence explosion idea that once a machine gets a bit of intelligence, it's going to just get skyrocketed without really defining what intelligence is or having a depth, or other than the definition I gave earlier. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it's almost like the assumption the machine can learn everything just by reading. So once it reads everything, then it'll just, you know, be super smart and go get ahead of us. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll maybe give an update when I finish the book. Um, about what uh, you know, how he's addressing these issues, but but this is his proposal. Like we need to do something like the Silomar DNA modification thing. We need to get behind this. We need to start putting things in place now before it gets out of control. Uh, and 
um, I, I don't think these are bad thoughts. I mean, these, these ideas here and these three points are interesting to think about. Uh, but I think, as I said earlier, to me personally, the setup to the requirement from this is, is not convincing to me at all. And I, I think it's more of a sort of a lack of understanding of how brains learn and what it means to know about the world. I mean, this is stuff we figured out in Menta, but most people don't know. Um, you know this thing, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. So this, this idea of the line there about we can expect AI systems to act preemptively to preserve their own existence is such a common theme in the, the threat of AI. So presumably from, from his line of argument, the, the reason for preemptively preserving a machine's own existence in the coffee fetcher is that without the machine, there would be no, there would be nothing to fetch the coffee. So it's not, it's not a selfish preservation. It's for the sake of the objective, but that itself requires some awareness of the machine realizing what it does. I just, there always seems to be a, a leap to um, this need for self-preservation that's built into the threat. Um, and it's, I don't, I don't yeah. see. Yeah, and, and, and his goal is that he's, you're right. And his point is that every objective you give it to do something right. will never lead self to self-preservation. Uh, I'm sorry if I interrupted you. No, no, yeah, I'm. Um, yeah, so that's that's sort of his his conclusion that you can't give a machine an objective without it basically ultimately just very quickly deciding that to solve side that objective I have to I have to, um, you know, make it and and you know he uses the example from the movie 2001: The Space Odyssey. You know how that's what, how the computer was doing. How was murdering the astronauts. Uh, or the travelers in this, you know, the spaceship, because it, it concluded that the safest way to complete its mission was to get rid of the humans. So, you know, you have that you know, science fiction. And everything. But it's true, it does require some level of self-awareness to know that it's a program that's running inside a machine that's connected to some power source that's, you oh, know, yeah. could be there. It requires a lot of awareness about its kind of context. And, where and awareness that it has this context, and and maybe he assumes that if we didn't put it in there, it wouldn't be aware that that this would be bad for humans and probably bad for itself, you know, um, to 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 destroy all humans. Um, I mean, it's hard to imagine that you know uh, uh, an AI system would be, could destroy humanity and yet still keep going. <laughs> you know, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah. well, I have a question about the book. You said. I think you said it, it wasn't necessarily the easiest read. Well, you know, it's funny because Janet, it really? Janet was reading my book again this weekend and she's, she's not a technical person. And, um, and so I can really see the things she has trouble with or things that you and I or people in the mentor would not have trouble with at all because we're immersed in this stuff. But when I read Stuart Russell's book, it's far more, you know, he's immediately jumping into um, reinforcement learning as if we know what it is and uh, talks about, you know, inverse reinforcement learning and, you know, makes like, everyone even know what that is and starts throwing in some equations about probability and Bayes' theorem. And so from that point of view, it's not a, a, a book that, a, um, that anyone could, could pick up, you know, and say, hey, I want to learn about, you know, AI. It's more like you'd have to be in the field, I think, to, to read this. It uh, doesn't mean that there would, couldn't be a lot of people who could do it. It just means that it, it's it's not for everybody. Yeah. What I find it interesting there is that the description of a of these three points is basically a super intelligence which is slave to humans. <laughs> and I wonder if there is like a, a third way. I mean, w one, it's a threat. Two, it's a slave, and then maybe a third way is that we have super intelligence machines which coexist with humans, but they're not necessarily like slaves. Well, I think his argument would be like, well, how can they coexist if they have their own objectives? You know, um, they'd have to they'd have to care about it in a very significant way. I guess. Um, I don't I don't know how that would. I, I I'm, I'm trying to put words in his mouth. I don't know. Okay. I mean, I, right, I, think, I think you're right. I, 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 don't, I just don't believe the premise that these machines will just, you know, become like totally about self-preservation. Um, and so if they didn't, then they could coexist with it easily. You know? 
Yeah, I also just thought that I think there'd be like a, a fairly simple test. Maybe this is too simplistic. But if you did have a machine that you thought was too intelligent to not really know what its uh, objectives, like how would it express its objectives, can you just sort of like put sort of like a, a kind of paradigm of like, it will have to propose what it's going to do and then you have to approve it. Like it's almost like you can do like a, like a trial run in a sense. Like, for, like if you gave like a gun to, to, to the machine and you said, you know, catch a deer for me. Like yeah. ideally you would know what it would do. Like you would say like, how would you use this gun and then get its feedback? But that may be. Yeah. yeah. Well, but the, maybe that fits into his three rules here. I don't know. What do you think? Uh, um, you're saying he, he wouldn't, the, the machine wouldn't figure it out. You just, the machine would come back and ask permission. <laughs> Essentially, yeah. I mean, I don't know. That's, it, it seems very, I don't know, somewhat trivial to do that, right? Just to, it's like, well, it's like, if you don't know what it's, um, you know, how it's going to express its, its objectives, can you just ask it before it, before it does yeah. it? Yeah. That's, that's an alternate to this, perhaps. I think it's a good observation. That'd be, instead of saying, instead of the machine trying to figure out what our, what our, um, preferences are the machine just could be programmed to always ask yeah I, I i i'm looking at this thing and it's a if you substitute for a machine the word government you have an interesting analogy and what do you learn from that well, well basically you can you can see that you know there's a variety of different governments you know uh, through history and across uh types of uh schemes but i mean basically i mean governments you know are kind of built or put into power with a set of goals ostensibly to help the common good. But uh, it's, it's like they're, they're trying to get reelected. So they're trying to look at what, you know, their constituents preferences are. And sometimes that can go badly awry or they find a particular way of remaining in power that is ultimately toxic. I'm, I'm thinking of yeah. fascism in, in Mussolini's uh, yeah. uh, Italy, for instance. Well, I think the way, you, the way that seems to play out is that the, the government decides it's going to benefit some people, but not everybody. And, right. And, it, and it then it's going to rig the system so that the people who are benefiting stay in power. Um, right. So there's a, there's a huge latitude and says the ultimate source of human preference is human behavior, but that that assumes that almost implicitly there's an archetype, uh, archetypical human that it's uh, aspiring to model. And yeah. I think I think he's aware that that's not true, um, but I don't okay. know how he's going to address it yet. So I, I, okay, well, I mean, he could be setting up a straw man here for, for your benefit. I don't think so. I think this is this is his point here. These are, but he again he says, well, this is what we have to do, but I realize there's some issues with this, <laughs> you know, and, I, and I'm going to go through them and try to address them going forward. So maybe I'll just give an update when I finish the book and, and I can talk about how we... Um... But I, I, I mean, I, I use government in there, but to me, it is, it is a meme of sorts uh, that you could, you could, you could apply this, uh, this abstraction to whole uh, ranges of systems that are out there and seeing you know, where the failure modes are. Mm. I think it's a good observation. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. All right. Well, that's that's it for me uh, on this topic. Unless someone else wants to say something. Okay. Um, Michelangelo, you wanted to do something. Should I stop the recording for that or keep it going? What do you think? I mean, it's definitely very unstructured. Um, so, so either way, um, but. Uh, you tell me, <laughs> otherwise I'll keep it going. <laughs> it's probably, I'd say probably. Just, hmm? No, I was going to say, I don't think it's probably worth it to, to record. I mean, but I don't know. Okay, why don't we keep it going? We can always trim it up. And then fix and post. Okay, sounds good. And, and Christy, you um, can probably drop yeah, out. Drop off. Right. I think this is going to be more technical. Probably. So it's just a, hopefully a quick question in more general. Um, uh, I, I don't really have it like pinned down per perfectly yet, but the question is really just what are our questions about like why networks? Like if we were to, to do any investigations in why networks in particular in machine learning, um, like what kind of things are, are we curious about? Um, I don't know if that, is that a, 
that's a bit broad, I guess, to start, but that's sort of um, sort of a yeah, kind networks of as opposed to what you said. What we well, said as opposed to wide networks as opposed from a like relatively like wide networks, um, like wide as in like you know like wider than ResNet as far as uh, um, you know I mean I mean it more of like a wider. I'm sorry, I heard why. Okay, my yeah, I heard why too, but you meant it said why. Oh yeah, sorry. Yes. Why with the D? First, I heard you say Y network. I'm like, what's a Y network? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. so you mean wider and shallower, um, as opposed to uh, deeper networks? I mean, same number of parameters, but instead of making it deeper, make it wider. Is that it? Uh, or just potentially? Yes. I guess I haven't really thought about how it would affect depth, but potentially, yeah. The question could could revolve around. Um, well, I guess the basic idea, if, you, if, you, if a wide layer was more powerful in some sense, you might need fewer, fewer of them. So I guess that's the thing. So part, part of it is also understanding when we say more powerful or when you say more powerful, you're talking about in terms of um, like in terms of its ability to like the like the SDR intuition of you have like a smaller and smaller chance of overlap, for, for instance. Is that correct? Well, that would be the that would be the the result of having a wide network. But I think that I, I mean I I don't know what it means in terms I mean powerful in terms of I guess you would achieve the same results if you you know with I don't know faster training and um, uh, you know less computation time I don't know I mean I mean yeah. uh, someone else could speak up about this I mean I I think we do we do have this intuition that when you go sparse. Uh, it's better to have a higher dimensionality, um, and uh, because if you're not very, if you don't have a high dimensionality and you go sparse, then you lose representational capacity. Okay. I, I don't know. If that that's the basic intuition, I think. It, it it seems like you just framed the question as can wider networks create more robust representation? Is that kind of the question you frame? Uh, yes. In particular, by the way, I have a meta question, which is what are our questions with, with wide networks? Like what are, <laughs> what are our interests in, in wide networks as far as um, like just sort of thinking about the value of, of, um, of, the, of that sparse linear package that I had mentioned before or to port some of that functionality into our own library. Like is that valuable and, and what, why is that valuable to us with respect to the questions that we have? Well, one, one of the things that a wide but shallow network gives you is it will be faster because you basically are, you have more parallel operations when you have something that's wider. If yeah. in fact you've dedicated hardware to it. And since you have fewer layers to go through, it's going to be a faster response. So there's, there's an engineering reason for doing that, even if there was an equivalency uh, in terms of uh, capacity. Okay. But but inherently, I think you would expect uh, continuous learning to require um, high sparsity. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a, a requisite for continuous learning. Mm -hmm. And it's also going to be a requisite for high robustness. That's the word. Um, and, um, and so, you know, there's a lot of benefits that come from sparsity. And you just can't get the sparse systems to work well if they're not wide. So I think. Kevin's right, computational efficiency, but I think there's going to be just some functional benefits that I, mean, I don't think we're going to get to continuous learning without wide networks and probably dendritic properties. But if that's not obvious, we should discuss it. No, I get that, yeah. Um, or, yeah, I think, I think I get the general intuition for that. So, so you also think that the, the wide networks could possibly supplement the, the continuous learning um, Stuff that we're working on uh, quite well, as well. Then. I mean, it just reducing the overlap between representations is a fundamental part of continuous learning. It means that you know I can learn new things about impacting existing things. Mm -hmm. So it's just a fundamental. You know, otherwise, if you have a dense, completely dense network, as most uh, convolutional neural networks are today, um, then you know you change anything; it changes everything. Um, when you have a sparse network, a very sparse network, you change something, it changes very few things. So um, it's part of, the, part of the inherent or fundamental solution to continuous learning. Okay. 
Yeah, and I think we, um, you know, all these three things, I think we've said three things, you know, the, if you have very sparse high dimensional networks, then you don't have interference from random patterns, um, which is kind of a required requirement for continuous learning. Um, with really sparse high dimensional things, you can get a lot of robustness to, to noise. So you can, um, you know, you can have very noisy versions of the patterns you've stored and you can still recognize it, um, which is harder to do with dense networks. That's another one. And the third one is computational reasons. You can, if you have really high dimensional systems, you can get by with, at least in, in biology, we know you can get by with a tiny number of synapses, like 20, you know, 10 or 20 synapses and still retain this real robustness properties and interference properties. And in fact, they get better in that. So you can get by with, you know, extremely low computational resources um, in theory with very, very high dimensional systems. Um, so those are, I mean, those are three pretty fundamental reasons. I don't know if there's more than that. Maybe there's more, um, uh, you know, but those, those are at least three pretty important reasons, I think. Yeah, it's interesting to see in biology in the brain, uh, you know, it settles on certain levels of sparsity and this connectivity and activity. Um, it might be that uh, it would be far more desirable to have even wider networks and even more sparsity, not uh, as a percentage, not as an absolute number of bits on. And biology has trouble doing that uh, because the sparsity makes something, it's harder it is for the neurons to find the other neurons they have to connect to. Uh, you know, if I say, oh, I need to make 20 synapses to a pattern out there. Well, if that pattern is distributed over, you know, a billion neurons, it's gonna be, you know, and there's only like 40 of those billion neurons active, it's gonna be hard for that neuron to find those things. So a large part of how brains, you know, learn is they have to form new connections and they have to, those connections have to be nearby and you have this whole pruning cycle when you're young. And, um, but we don't have any of those limitations um, in a non-biological system. And so it might be possible to make extremely sparse systems that even perform far better than human systems in some ways. Uh, but biology couldn't go there from a practical point of view from biology. It just doesn't have enough wiring to, you know, connect two neurons that are remotely apart. And, has, and there's nobody sitting there going, oh, this neuron A has to connect to neuron B, so I'll, I'll put a wire in. It can only do that with local rules, which just makes it difficult. So we, I, it's possible we can do much, much better than humans in this regard. <laughs> yeah. uh, and human sparsity might be just like the, 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 the limit that's reachable in biology. Well, yeah, there's some, uh, in terms of sort of non-biological things like back propagation, I think with very high dimensional systems, they, they, people are showing that learning works better. It's harder to get stuck in local minima and things like that. But that there's, I don't think those things are dealing with sparse systems, but anyway, that's one example. I thought of another reason why high dimensionality is important with sparsity is that you can do unions uh, more effectively. Mm. Um, so you can represent more and more things in superposition and you can represent uncertainty better um, so that's another thing we've talked about quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. And in the, uh, there's, there's a branch of statistics that has looked into this, I think from a Bayesian perspective, it's like, uh, I forget, densely distributed, uh, th I forget what the name is. It's like a, a something distributed coding. Um, that from a statistical point of view and a Bayesian point of view has, has looked into this as well and they get to similar conclusions, I think. Wouldn't the local rule in biology have some kind of function that would be missing if we decide to be a global? Could you explain that again, Louis? I didn't follow. You said like, you know, in biology, the neurons will find the neurons nearby. Usually they have some kind of com commonality in their inputs or whatever. And if we decide to go to neurons that are far away, they may not be related it, at all. It, it, don't think of it as far away or close. Think of it as just more neurons that are sparsely activated. So imagine you could, um, it, it's, it's really not about distance. It's, it's more, you know, I could take a single cortical column and in theory, I put a lot more neurons in that cortical column and not, you know, let's say, I don't have to increase the volume of the column. It's, it's not about distance, it, and it's not saying I'm now gonna connect to something, necessarily connecting something 
that's different, although our voting norms do that. Um, it's, it's just a matter of saying, uh, you know, imagine if I could put 500,000 neurons in the cortical column. Awesome. And I'm, I'm going to make them one fifth as one, five times sparser or one fifth of the density activation. Um, you know, it, it doesn't mean that the neurons are actually doing something else. It just means I'm going to use more neurons to represent the same thing. And, um, and just because they're sparser means it's in the brain, physically, that means, you know, I do have to go a little bigger distance. But again, in the brain, I might have, a, I could say, well, the brain could have settled on a cortical column that was two millimeters in diameter. So that would be four times as, you know, area as one that's one millimeter. And, and so a cortical column would still process and do all the same stuff, but it would, be, it would still be harder for the neurons to find the other neurons that are active because physically the wires have to go by near each other. Does that, does that make that sense? That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, these are good questions. I think I'd, uh, there might be more, more to it too. But there's this uh, uh, computer science theorist who's done uh, quite a few studies on the effects of depth and um, width of networks, named Sanji Ferrara. And I think um, I haven't really looked too much into some of his stuff, but I think um, in, in one of his papers, he may have claimed that like. Uh, when you have wider networks, it helps with uh, tasks when you have a lot less training data. Um, but I think they're always, they've always been dealing with dense networks. So I'm not sure if his results would apply to sparse networks too. I, so, I, 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 I zoned out there for a second, Karen. Could you just say the conclusion? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, with, uh, I was just looking through um, one of his um, papers on the effect of um, infinitely wide networks on small yeah. having less data. And in the conclusion, he said that um, they're more efficient at learning um, from, from less amounts of data, but they're dealing with dense networks. So what would be the intuition for that? Uh, why would a very wide dense network have require less data to train on? It's not immediately obvious to me. Um, does anyone have an intuition for that? Did, well, I did they? Wide, I know a wide network, at least in machine learning theory is um, like the wider they get, the more they approximate it like a convex function. So at least from that point of view, like the optimization should be like more, should be easier in the sense that you should be able to go just more directly towards um, the minimum, as opposed to sort of traveling a bit around the loss yeah. and then diving in. But that's yeah, I, that makes sense to me on a sort of a sort of semi-intuitive level, but I wouldn't have reached, I wouldn't have been able to say confidently that it was actually gonna work. I mean, it's sort of, to me, that's like a, Maybe it's clear to you, but to me, that's like a hand wavy thing. Like, yeah, yeah, kind of, yeah, sure. You know, it's, it's, it's a more complex, uh, um, um, you know, form you're creating here, and, and it'd be easier to get to your minimum. Um, yeah. But <laughs> is it, yeah, understanding that would be helpful there. And yeah. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, I no, no, no. no. Uh, I was going to say there is this uh, idea of over parameterized networks that once you cross what, what you call the interpolation threshold. So, so the whole idea is that uh, when you have as much parameters as you have uh, data points, then you can basically just memorize all the data, data points. And then when you cross that threshold, then you have more free parameters, then you have data points, then you start using those extra parameters uh, as kind of interpolation functions, uh, learning easier ways to interpolate between existing data points to find uh, an interpolation function that it's simpler than the, the full representation of the data point. But wouldn't it be true that even a very wide network, I mean, don't go infinitely wide network, you know, just pick a much wider network than people use today. Wouldn't it be true that the number of parameters is still going to be vastly less than the number of uh, training samples? Well, not necessarily, because in this case, we're talking, uh, Caruana was specifically talking about uh, learning a field samples with a very wide network. So you could have a network which is over parameterized compared to the number of data points it has. But, so are you saying that the network wouldn't, wouldn't learn too many things? It just would be a limited learning? Um, oh, it, would, it would first memorize everything, because it has parameters to memorize everything, yeah. and then use all the extra parameters you have uh, to learn simpler 
I guess I'm saying learning everything. Okay. Learning everything means that there's not a lot to learn. Yeah, if yeah. I'm, in this case, I mean, if I'm trying to learn, you know, a hundred thousand things, uh, I'd have to have a, a lot more than a hundred thousand parameters to get that idea to work, right? Um, yeah. So, I mean, I mean, I can see, I can see what you're saying. If I basically say, oh, I want to learn a few things, sure, I can see that. But it seems to me we want to go in the opposite direction. We want to learn more things, not fewer things. <laughs> Um, but but uh, Lucas, are you saying you know you might have a network with you know a billion parameters and it's only learning a million things, and now what does it do with the other nine hundred ninety nine million parameters? <laughs> it's it's going to learn some sort of interpolation function or something. Yeah, the, uh, there is a lot of discussion on this. I think there was this uh, seminal paper in uh, two thousand seventeen where an author proposed this this idea, and and this behavior has been shown in in empirically you know that when you is cross this, this double, in, is this this double descent thing yeah yeah it, this is the double descent thing but i guess well, isn't this a trivial thing in some sense like I mean, i'm sorry i'm missing it but you're saying we'll make a big enough network that it can remember everything quickly it's just like a bunch of you know one shot well, i think he's saying it's even we're, we're going to make a much bigger network than you need to remember everything yeah i understand that i and so there's some benefits for that but just the, the starting assumption, we're going to make a network that can memorize everything because it's so big, it's just going to memorize everything. It's, 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 um, I don't know, maybe I'm missing something. Yeah, um, but, but then you want, you want generalization as well, right? So yeah. if, if you just memorize everything, then you don't have generalization. But if you do memorize everything, and then you have all these extra parameters, and you can learn good interpolation functions, then you can... Memorize and generalize at the same time. So you think you think the generalization would just come naturally because of the over parameter types, you know, so many extra parameters that, that there'll be a natural space around each data point that it'll generalize. Yeah, like that, that. That, that, that's a hypothesis. But, yeah. but Lucas, there must be something other than just a lot of extra parameters. There must be some other pressure to towards good interpolation mechanism. Because when you have so many other parameters, the argument is, you can learn, you know, almost any function of the training examples. And so you can learn really bad interpolation functions too. So how do you, what, there must be something else to force it to learn quote unquote good interpolations. No, uh, it's it simple. Just interpolation. be the number of parameters, right? Right, right. Uh, yeah, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure what, which, which pressure, what is driving the optimization towards that. Uh, I remember reading there was uh, this drive towards learning simpler representations with all these extra parameters, but I, I, I also yeah, don't have the intuition of why, what, what is putting that. Yeah, there has on. to be some other like regularization or something that says, okay, prefer simpler things or smoother things or something like that. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I think one straw man would be if you have this massively wide network you're able to capture a gestalt of whatever the inputs are and kind of have that kind of buffered in some way. And during sleep, there's kind of reconsolidation of that maybe to a simpler representation, uh, condensation. So I'm just wondering if during sleep consolidation, you, something is working to generate, to, to reparameterize that thing. So the next time through, uh, there's a there's a simpler recognition mechanism than simply memorization of mm. all the inputs. What so, would that be? Some sort of magic sleep function? Well, it, it's replay, right? I mean, uh, but, but replay would you have to have the replay, not just redo what the learning that occurred earlier, right? Right, but I I would I. I, I mean, it sounds good. Yeah, no, I I, I can't I can't I, I can't say. Uh, I can't tie it to a particular uh, region of the brain to do that, yeah. except for the fact that we do know that that replay occurs, and that would be a great opportunity for uh, something to, you know, simplify the representation. Yeah. yeah, I think that's right. I just, I just, I don't have a solution what the what the learning replay function would actually do and why we do right. That. But, but I mean, we we have so many arguments that well, we we don't have a mechanism for backprop. But if there's a way of consolidating the memory in a simpler representation, I mean, at, at a cognitive level, 
you know, I, I steep myself in something and all of a sudden, you know, things align and I can say, oh, you know, the simpler representation suggests itself that, you know, explains everything else I see. I can forget all the crap, you know, that, you know, all the you know, half experiments and stuff like that that I've done and say, oh, this, this reduces it down to this one simple concept. So yeah. I, 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 I have to believe that, you know, that something like that has to be occurring at a, at a lower level just so we can cope with stuff. I was thinking, you know, I think that, that, that uh, transfer to all of a sudden when you understand something more deeply. Um, uh, I, I argued in the, in the new book that, that much of that is, is figuring out the right reference frame for the data you have, right? So you have all these facts, right? All these things, observations you have, but they're not actionable until they've applied to a reference frame where you have actions which, which lead from point to point and then everything becomes. Uh, so the, the process of, I argued in the book that the process of becoming an expert or really deeply understanding something it is to have the right reference frame for it. So just, I'm just throwing this as an aside. Um, I think that what you were calling consolidation or, or simplification or whatever, um, much of that is just rearranging, the, figuring out the right behaviors and reference frames in which to rearrange the facts you have. And it's not obvious up front what the right way to do that is. And so what we do when we, we, we're puzzled by a bunch of facts in front of us, I even wrote about this non-intelligence, you know, you just rearrange them, put them down differently on a piece of paper, you know, just sort them in a different way. Or in the example of in, in the thousand brains, I argued how you could take historical facts and arrange them in a timeline versus a geospatial map. And um, so it's just, that to me is like that, that, that all of a sudden when you say, oh, and now I get it, you know, that's what's mm -hmm. happening. You, you found a better reference frame that sort of everything kind of clicks together, which means yeah. you which means you've discovered a, a closer representation to the actual structure of the world or the thing you're looking at. You know, right. if it's not, if you, if you rip, if you map the data in a way that doesn't really map to the physical world, it's just not going to work. And you just won't be able to figure out how to solve problems. But as soon as you find some a reference frame that really maps to the physical world and you go, Oh crap, now I understand it. Well, <laughs> I mean, it, to, to me, there, it, to the extent that uh, emotions are a driving factor for memorization, uh, it's the fact that if all of a sudden something crystallizes, there's this great sense of relief that I can let go of yeah. this other stuff and substitute this in its place. And so I wondered, I I wondered how, it's an interesting question, how does the brain know, how does the neocortex know? I mean, what, what is the real biological mechanism for detecting that it's now got a better reference frame? I mean, the predictions all come out true, I don't know. It's, it's, and then, you know, so there has to, that aha moment is, is clearly something that's recognized and it's an emotional moment. And then the brain says, this is it, remember this. Um, yeah, the, that, the, the clarity that comes with that is somehow has to be recognized in the neurons right away, like bingo. It's like I, I talked about that, like all of a sudden, you, all these constraints are satisfied at once. I don't mm -hmm. quite know what the biological mechanism for that is. Interesting question. Well, it, it'll be fascinating to discover where that lies. It's got to be local in the cortex because that's where the models are created. Like, so there has to be something in the cortical column that says, oh, I've discovered a, I mean, the simple thing to say is it's making correct predictions, but it seems like if you do a whole bunch at once, it's like, it's like all of a sudden, you know, that all your predictions are going to be true. It's just like somehow it just knows. I don't know. wouldn't, wouldn't it come with less activity, like markedly less activity? Well, if, if you just base it on prediction, yeah. Right, if, 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 if all of a sudden the cortical column is making correct predictions. And I think that's generally correct. It just seems to me that, like, I, I go back to the issue that if you're satisfying a lot of constraints at once, and that's the bigger the aha moment, that how does it, making all those, is it considering all those constraints at the same time and making predictions all at the same time? Well, well what, sure. one, one epiphenomena is when they look at uh, how the, the brain activity of, if someone's fed a mathematical problem and, uh, non-specialists, the brain lights up everywhere. It's like they're trying to harness all the parts of the brain to try to solve this problem and trying to find an analogy, mm. whatever it is. Whereas the specialists, you know, there's only activity in a localized area. It's low level because they're basically, you know, I've, I've, I've got this scheme. I can do it. Yeah. I can work through it. Well, that goes back to Michelangelo's argument that, in, you know, fundamental to our theory is that prediction. Um, is the you know correct prediction is the 
not this means you understand something and it'd be less activity right so yeah um, so, so yeah. what drives it to find you know uh to to you know find that aha moment it's there's got to be something persistently irritating the brain about something you know yeah well, I, you could argue that misprediction is, as Michael Angel suggests, misprediction could be the irritating thing. Well, uh, hopefully that would be biologically preserved because if you didn't, you would, you would, you would die. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I guess it all the prediction hypothesis that we have makes sense. I guess it's, it's just, it's just the, it, it's the quantity issue for me. It's not the quality. I mean, I think you're right. The answer is the brain all of a sudden figures out it has a has a model here that makes correct predictions and it's low activity and that looks good. Yeah. Um, the problem I had again is like, how does that happen for a really big aha moment when you satisfy all these constraints seemingly instantaneously? It's like, is it, but maybe it's not instantaneous. Maybe you maybe go through a series of tests really quickly. You know, it could it could go from like, oh, let me go through my constraints. Oh, they all work. That's great. I don't know. It's possible. Yeah. Well, there's there's got to be some degree of coordination in order to make that happen. Yeah. So the question is, what is that unifying coordination? Yeah. I forget how we got onto this from uh, White Network. Yeah. yeah, from the White Network. Yeah, not, not to run away too much, but I think my, 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 uh, my, the main question, my meta question was, was answered pretty sufficiently. So thanks all. Um, but, but Michael, Andrew, did you ask, did you think there was a, were you thinking there's something else that we're missing that, that would, we could add to this list? Um, well, I guess if anything, you know, I, I wasn't probing it from that perspective. I was more either just sort of, probing it from like a, you know, over the next week, it, it maybe just sort of, as I kind of think about this, um, you know, maybe diffusely in the background, like just sort of kind of keeping tabs on these things. I'm particularly interested in if this is helpful in our investigation in, into continual learning as, as we undergo that. Um, I would say in this conversation though, I also was just kind of like curious and I'm gonna try to think through this for, for myself. Is just how does this relate to um, column voting? Um, just because I, I also think about those lateral connections as some form of wideness. So I kind of want to sort of reconcile that form of wideness with you know this sort of other definition of like a wide layer mm. that's the speed forward wide layer. Yeah, the column voting, the big thing there was being able to represent lots of different hypotheses simultaneously so you can then narrow it down so the superposition idea was was pretty important in the column voting but um, i think the problem with column voting is that it was based on an idea that each column is doing a sort of complete object modeling and so you know what they're voting on is is a commonality of a thing and i don't know if that works in a system that doesn't have reference frames and movement and you know is more of a convolutional network maybe it does i don't know it's not clear to me they would know different parts of the wide region or wide uh, layer would know how to have something to vote on no no i think it would need you would need that something like that okay so but yeah we, yeah we, i was we, just saying the high dimensional part of it is that we could represent multiple hypotheses simultaneous it's just the union yeah yeah uh, thing. yeah as, yeah as you without, said that you know the union property reminded me and this made me occur this may be pretty obvious i don't know but when you said the union property you know is this i have a pattern and i have another pattern i want to represent simultaneously well the union property let's say i don't get confused the two two do not interfere with each other sufficiently to get confused about anything and sparsity uh, requires it but, but it occurred to me that that's the same as noise i if i'm if i'm pattern a um, and pattern B is another pattern that I'm trying to do simultaneously. I don't want to get confused by pattern B. Well, pattern B could just be noise too. So um, yeah. from, my, from pattern A's perspective, pattern B is noise or another thing you don't really know. So sort of noise robustness, I never thought of it this way, but noise robustness and union property are really the same thing. Um, or very related. Maybe, maybe we knew that. Yeah, yeah. I just hadn't thought of that. Occurred to me. Um, yeah. I think that that I, that basic idea that you can now have multiple representations, uh, whether you're learning a new pattern, whether you're trying to do a union of patterns, whether you've got a noisy input, the fact that an other patterns do not interfere with the original one in any significant way, uh, is the basic idea that we're we're shooting for here. Okay, and that is totally related to continuous learning because I can just lay down another memory, and um, it's just not going to affect 
any other memory in any significant event way. Oh, that makes sense. That's all I got. Okay, cool. Anything else, anyone? Yeah, I was confused about the column voting. How does that, why it gives you column voting? Uh, for, for my comment? Yeah, I do not understand that. How does a wide rep network is going to give you column voting? I uh, understand the union part, but not the column voting. I wasn't saying that it gives you column voting. I was just drawing a weak analogy between like the, the notion of a wide network and the fact that if you sort of con consider all the lateral connections in column voting together, it's, it's sort of, it has, it's, it's wide in a different way. So I just had a, a kind of question of how to reconcile those two different definitions of wide. Um, if you think about, if you think about, um, um, you know, a system where you have columns and, you know, send, you know a, a true thousand brain type of system, uh, I think the same requirement for sparsity of column activation is, is or, 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 you know, this, each column has to have a very sparse activation to share. Um, because otherwise you'd have the, I mean, you have the same issues in voting between columns um, in general, where if they're going to, if voting's going to work, it works better if the patterns that are being, the, the votes are, are sparse patterns. Mm -hmm. um, for the same reasons, you can have multiple votes at the same time and they're noise resistant and so on. But I, I don't think that column, it's it just anytime you want to, Anytime you want to represent something, it's better to do it with a very sparse, wide area. So it's yeah. either the out, it could be the output of columns, or it could be the you know the output of individual cells in a convolution. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that makes sense. It's also interesting though in the, in the column voting now. Not only is it wide within the layer, but it's also wide across many layers, right? It's a, or uh, wide, acro yeah, across across the region. Across saying. the region, yeah, 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 yeah right, yeah. It's narrow, it's wide within a, a column. And we yeah. talked about that earlier, like maybe we can do wider than biology. And then it has got to be wide. Uh, it's also wide and, and across the, uh, the number of columns. Yeah. yeah, you get similar benefits on both scales. You do, right. yeah. Yeah. An interesting thing that was just popping into my head is like, imagine I have a region with, um, you know, several thousand columns. Um, Maybe maybe fifty five thousand columns and like that. Do we assume that you know the output of each of those columns would be sparse if it, when it's voting and saying, "Hey, I think it's this," and someone else thinks it's that. But um, do we assume that that individual columns, some of them are inactive, so that the actual number of columns that are active at any point in time is sparse, or would I say like, "No, all the columns in the visual region D one are going to be active at the same time"? Um, hmm. Yeah, I don't think we have any. But certainly in the, in the models we implemented, there was no inhibition across yeah. cortical columns. Not, and I don't and I don't think there's anything in the bi is there anything, anything in the biology that way also? No, I don't think so. That? so I don't, no, I don't think so. Yeah. So I, I just it just occurred to me. So my working yeah. assumption would be wouldn't be that the case is that every column would be trying to do something and every column would have a very sparse output, but every column would be doing something, every column would be active. Um, I guess by collaborating across cortical columns you know, things get sparser as you get more and more certain of what you're saying. So in that sense, yeah. globally, the sparsity would increase. Yeah, so. yeah. But every column would vote. Every yeah, I think every, vote. at yeah. the moment, I would go for every column vote. <laughs> yeah. Every column that's in the processing stream we're dealing with, right? So if I'm just looking at something and I'm not hearing something, obviously the other, other columns aren't voting. Uh, but if I'm looking at something, all the visual columns that are getting input are voting, and and if I'm listening to something, all the auditory columns are, are getting input about it. Um, of course, you know, if I'm looking at something from vision, and it's a very small part of my visual field model, but not all the columns are getting input. So. Yeah, so other cortical columns could just not have anything to say at any point in time. Yeah. <laughs> something yeah. like that. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, I'll just keep quiet. <laughs> yeah. I'm not seeing anything. I see nothing. <laughs> Did that help? Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. Right. I, I look uh, forward to implementing these things.
Yeah. <laughs> it's good, exciting, really. Come on. Good, exciting. I like it. I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>